Thank you. Uh, in, in the words of Monty Python, now for something completely different. Um, I'm from uh, Airbus Australia. Um, I put a Twitter thing up there. Um, I looked the other day and the last tweet was 2013 that I made, so um, clearly I'm an introverted engineer. Um, a voyeur, not an exhibitionist, perhaps. Um, this, is, um, this is about ADA, uh, not the Apple Design Awards, um, but the ADA programming language. Um, I'd be curious to know, well, what we're going to talk about is uh, why we wanted to um, port software written in ADA to an iPad, uh, a little bit how, about how we went about it, and some of the challenges that we faced along the way. Um, if someone asks you in the next couple of days uh, what you saw at DevWorld, I don't want you to sort of say that uh, you saw this demented old man who wanted to write apps in, uh, in ADA, um, and he must have completely lost the plot. Um, there is a reason we wanted to do this. Um, so uh, I'm, a, I'm a demented old man, but um, I haven't quite completely lost the plot yet. Um, before I go on, can I just ask how many people have heard of ADA for a start? So, oh, that's a good number. Uh, how many people have actually written in ADA? One, two, cool. Okay. Um, for those that have never heard of it, uh, the ADA language came about in uh, the late 70s, early 80s, I guess, uh, primarily from the United States Department of Defense, who was looking for a reliable language to use in their embedded systems. Uh, it came to be used in a lot of high integrity and safety critical systems, um, particularly in defense and aerospace. Um, it's got its roots in Pascal. Uh, it has its own standard. I think the last standard was 2012, so it is still under reasonably active development. Uh, for those that are interested, it's named after uh, this lady here, whose name is Augusta Ada King Knoll, or the Countess of Lovelace, or more commonly known as Ada Lovelace. She was the daughter of Lord Byron, who was uh, an English poet you may or may not have heard of. Um, but she was better known for her work with Charles Babbage, who was the uh, inventor of the analytical engine, uh, which is the precursor to the modern digital computer. And she's credited with being, or writing, the first algorithm for that uh, uh, analytical engine. So she's really the first computer programmer, uh, and that was nearly 200 years ago in the 1800s. The Ada language is not currently used uh, an awful lot in, I guess, everyday computing, but still widely used in aerospace and defence. And um, anyway, enough the history lesson, I guess. Why, um, the question is why would you want to write software in ADA on an iPad? We've got uh, Swift, we've got Objective-C, um, probably a few other languages as well. So why on earth would you want to put ADA on an iPad? Well, um, we work, and I say we because uh, I didn't do this alone. We work for uh, Airbus. They're a global aircraft manufacturer. Um, they don't just make uh, aircraft or commercial aircraft. They also make uh, things in the space and defense industries, uh, as well as helicopters. Um, Brisbane Airport, we're responsible for the production and, uh, and maintenance of uh, two helicopters for the Army. One's the ARH Tiger, or the Armed Reconnaissance Helicopter, and the other one's uh, an MRH Taipan, which is the multi-role helicopter. Um, I don't know whether this is where I should apologise for coming from Queensland. Um, we're not all angry rednecks, so uh, I, know that, I know Canberra went a bit mad last week, but, uh, and it might not be a coincidence, but my son uh, and his primary school went there for a, uh, an ex school excursion last week, so I think that's got something to do with it. Um, anyway, so we work on this helicopter. It's, um, it's uh, I guess, it was, I think it's the first fully composite um, and fly-by-wire helicopter uh, used in defence. And uh, we work in the avionics system. So um, the avionics, uh, we, we do software maintenance in the avionics system. So avionics is basically aviation electronics. 
and it's concerned primarily with communication and navigation systems in the aircraft. So we're not talking about uh, flight control systems uh, or autopilots, they're a little bit more, uh, I guess, um, highly critical, uh, but certainly the, the avionics system. And we only really work on a small part of it. This is a, uh, an off-the-shelf helicopter, if you could call such a thing as off-the-shelf. But there is a, there's a bit of, um, I guess, uh, specific stuff done for the Australian variant, and uh, that's the area that we look after. But the bulk of the software is actually managed uh, in Europe, um, and there's a, there's a, a lot of um, countries that actually uh, use this helicopter. Uh, this uh, is also the replacement for the, uh, the Black Hawk helicopter, which has used, been used by the Army for years. Um, it's got a very complex avionics system. Uh, and I say complex, but most aircraft have fairly complex avionics systems, particularly now everything's digitised. Um, and that's the, uh, uh, the cockpit of the, uh, of the Taipan helicopter. So it looks, I mean, it looks impressive and fairly complicated, but that's a fairly standard cockpit for, I guess, a lot of aircraft uh, these days. The main interface for uh, aircrew is what we call the display and keyboard unit, or a DKU. And uh, they're located in the centre console. There's one for a pilot and one for a co-pilot. And a little bit up close there, um, the DKU's got this small screen, uh, which some coloured text on it. It's text only, there's no graphics. Um, and it's got 70 plus buttons which are used for selecting different operations and entering data. And it's got a fairly complex hierarchy of display screens, um, usually referred to as pages. And the data entry is really quite complex as well. Um, the user experience is really crap actually. Um, so if you went to uh, yesterday afternoon's workshop, um, there's quite a difference between using one of these and uh, what we were talking about yesterday. So it's a really steep learning curve for not just air crew, but um, maintenance um, staff as well, and plus engineers that work on the system, uh, whether that's software engineers or um, other aircraft engineers that have to work on the system. So what we did was um, to assist in this training, we made uh, an app, a fairly simple app. It's basically, we took the, uh, it's a, a really crude simulator of an, uh, um, on the iPad. And what we did was take screenshots of all the different pages um, and use the buttons to sort of, I guess, scroll through different screenshots. Uh, the iPad's really a good choice for this because um, of its size and portability. And um, another good reason for it was that air crew use iPads as what they call an electronic flight bag. So an electronic flight bag is a, a portable device which you use to store um, flight manuals, maps, um, checklists and various other data that they would normally carry on to an aircraft in paper. Um, so a fairly simple thing, we, uh, we had a whole lot of buttons we put on there, I don't know, something like 75 buttons and we just had a UI image to display uh, screenshots and it, it um, when you rotate it, what we did was we drew this tree view because um, the idea was to train them through navigation of the different pages. So we put this tree view on the side and when you're um, in a certain place in the hierarchy, it'll highlight the page where you're supposed to be or where you're at. And um, it's broken up into different functional areas. So that's one tree view of, uh, I guess, a number. It's probably at least a dozen. and. It'll show you where you are in the hierarchy, but also when you tap on there, you can actually go directly to that screen. Now, um, that's not how the real system works, but it helps um, with training pilots or air crew so that they know what's on a certain screen. Um, we added another tab on there as well, which brings up flight manual data for that specific page. So that's, um, and that's just rendered in HTML. Uh, we extracted the data from the flight manual into an HTML format and just put it in a simple UI web view. Fairly easy. So it's a pretty simple application. It's not very complex. Um, you push buttons, it displays screens. Um, but it's been a, a fairly valuable resource. Um, previously, aircrew used to have to sit through hours and hours of um, 
slide presentations to show them the different screens and how to navigate between different screens. And we've saved them about one to two weeks of training. Uh, also, they can take the thing back to their room or uh, practice it in their own time. And the instructors told us that when, uh, when students get to a, a real aircraft or a, a flight simulator, um, they're very familiar with the system and how it works um, when they get there as opposed to when they were uh, learning through slides. But of course, like most customers, they're never satisfied. Uh, they always want more. And one of the main shortcomings was the data entry. So data entry, we couldn't do that um, in this simple system. And that's one of the areas where the, um, the user interface is really difficult to, uh, I guess, understand. So entering data and making selections is fairly complex. A whole, um, requires a whole lot of different button presses. And it doesn't really function like a DKU. In fact, they said it works too fast. When they get to the aircraft, they start pushing buttons and it doesn't do what they want. So um, I guess the question then was, um, what do we do about that? Um, I guess our, our options were, you know, if we wanted a proper f uh, simulator, we could, um, we could rewrite the, uh, the avionics code in Swift or Objective-C. Um, not a great option. There's about three million lines of code in that. Um, and to translate that every time we upgraded the software for the aircraft uh, wouldn't have been a great idea. Um, the third option is not really good, I suppose. We can give up and go home. But it's not really that much fun for a, a software developer. The second option became possible. Uh, uh, a company called AdaCore released an ARM7 uh, cross-compiler for iOS. I think it was around the end of 2016. And very grateful that they uh, provided us with an evaluation copy of the tool set to uh, enable us to develop a proof of concept. Um, so that's why we wanted to port Ada to an iPad. Uh, how do we go about it? Um, well, first a little bit about uh, AV, um, uh, the MRH system avionics. Um, there's no test, so don't worry. Um, but I just wanted to give you an idea of uh, what we're dealing with and where this DKU thing sits into the system. So that's the, um, a rough diagram of the avionics system. There's two subsystems. One we call the core system, and the other one's the, uh, and that's in orange there, and then there's the mission system which is in blue. And uh, the HMI interface, or human machine interface, is down the bottom there in green, and that includes uh, this DKU thing that I've been talking about. Uh, I'm not gonna go through all the acronyms, that's not important. Um, there are two ones that I wanna sort of bring to your attention. They're sort of in the middle there. One's called the core management computer, and the other one's the mission tactical computer. So they're the main computer um, used in the two subsystems. All the other components that are attached to it, um, they're called remote terminals. So the, the CMC, or the core management computer, and the MTC, the mission tactical computer, they basically control each of the two subsystems. Um, and all the other bits are connected on. Uh, and they include the intercom system, uh, various radios, uh, HF radios, radar, that type of thing. Uh, they all talk to each other on what is called a mill bus, which is a military standard uh, network. Um, and then there's some other different communication protocols used there, like ARINC, serial, uh, some video stuff. So that's what we call our target computer environment. Um, the CMC and the MTC are the two ones there highlighted, and down the bottom is the DKU. So these three talk to each other. When we do software development, um, Basically, they're the two computers that we, uh, uh, the CMC and the MTC are the main ones that we modify, and the pages that are in the DKU. So if we want to change the, the layout of the pages, we load just uh, different page sets. Um, the rest of the, um, the, the parts of the system we don't modify, and even if they do get modified, we have to modify those two anyway, uh, because they control all the interfaces. So in our target environment, we have um, a much simpler system. We can uh, run the CMC and the MTC and the DKU um, in our host environment, sorry. And we connect this to a little front end written in C, so we can display on the screen a, a mock-up of the DKU page. 
Um, and the communication here is done through TCP IP networking. So we replace the mill bus with a TCP IP networking. There's a little bit of, um, uh, I guess, code written in uh, all those uh, three main systems there to um, implement that TCP IP networking um, in the host side of things. Um, but this is much easier to use in the target environment because loading up the target can take up to 40 minutes or uh, in the old system it used to take a couple of hours. Um, we can, uh, you know, it provides a really good way of testing the CMC and the DKU and the MTC and how they fit together. Um, and we can run a basic simulation of the full avionics system by using canned data. So we don't really care what the data is, we're concentrating more on the communication between those three components. Um, now, in the host environment, someone had already ported um, from our Unix system uh, to Windows using uh, an Ada Core tool, uh, which is a GPS um, compiler set, uh, GNU or GNAT Programming Studio, I think it's called, cool, and GNAT stands for GNADA um, Tool Set, I think. Yes, GNADA Ada Tool Set. Um, this was already done by one of our colleagues a few years ago, so we had this thing actually running uh, in a Windows environment. So the steps to get it to work on iOS, um, we decided not to go straight to iOS, so we thought we'd go to um, Mac OS first because it might be easier to sort out some of the issues, um, particularly going from 32 to 64-bit architecture, developing the TCP IP networking in an Apple environment, and um, if we had it running on Mac OS, it'd be a little bit more confident that we could move it to iOS. Um, the only thing we really had to do was do the front end um, and write the TCP IP networking stuff. Um, so once we had this thing running in macOS, then we tried to port it to iOS, um, and that was the most challenging part of the whole exercise. To do that, um, so I guess when we execute in macOS, um, the CMC and the MTC can be run as separate executables. So you can open up a terminal, start the CMC, start the MTC, start the DKU, and then run an application, uh, which is the display. And then it can talk to all those things um, via the TCP IP networking. So that's fine in a macOS environment. They can all be run as separate processes, uh, as separate executables. Um, the problem is, uh, we also left out the MTC because it's got uh, restricted code in there so, and our development environment wasn't restricted so it's an unclassified network so we had to leave that out but anyway um, to do that in iOS uh, is not possible um, you can't run separate processes I don't think um, in iOS because of the sandboxed application so what we basically did was um, instead of running um, in separate processes, we thought we'd build static libraries uh, and then create a main program for each of those or a main function for each of those and then um, link them all together in the one application. So, and then we could run the CMC and the MTC as separate threads in this application. Um, This is, uh, this is possible because you can get uh, the ADA to talk to the Swift via um, sort of bridging headers, I guess, and vice versa, we can get Swift to talk to ADA. Um, so we can actually communicate between the two languages if necessary. Um, they both use C calling conventions if, uh, if they want. So to go from, uh, uh, I guess, the main issues in translating from Mac OS to iOS was um, building the CMC and the, MT, um, and the DKU, the static libraries, um, instead of uh, separate executables. Um, we start the main functions in separate threads. Um, one of the problems with this approach is that um, the CMC and the DKU share some low-level functionality. So they have the same function names at lower level. 
So you had to do a whole lot of refactoring to prevent name clashes there. Um, so when you compile it all into the single executable, um, yes, there were all sorts of funny things started happening. Another issue related to sandboxed applications in iOS as the um, in the host environment, because it's, it was built for testing, there's a lot of log files written out and there's also a whole lot of configuration files. Um, it's not part of a normal target environment, but um, in order to get um, sort of, I guess, access, we needed to get um, uh, the Swift code to tell the Ada code where it could write to uh, in uh, a sandboxed application. So we had to... Uh, give it access to the bundle paths and also the temporary directory. Uh, it wasn't too hard, they were just fairly straightforward functions to put in there. Um, so we ended up with an Xcode project uh, which had the simple DKU front end uh, and the network interfaces and we managed to get it run on an iPad um, and, the, and the simulator as well. Uh, it works um, just it's, pretty, it's a bit slow and unstable, um, but we've kind of proved that you can actually do it. This is uh, hopefully a small recording. Runs for about 30 seconds. Hopefully you can see the screen will change. Um, you can see the button presses. Those magenta, when everything goes magenta, that's what happens. It sends through, the message comes through first, um, changes the screen to all magenta for the next for the next screen. Um, so that's it kind of working. Um, I didn't show any data entry because I couldn't remember how to enter data in there, so that means that the, <laughs> the user experience is rubbish. Um, but we did actually get the thing to work, uh, which was great. Um, reflecting on some of the challenges, um, I didn't mention this before um, because it was sort of solved from going from Unix to Windows was the end in this uh, thing because we're dealing with low level avionics we're, we're talking um, uh, I guess you know bit patterns and that sort of thing so end in this can, can be a problem so you need to ensure you got the, um, that correct because we're moving from Motorola to Intel chips um, when you go from Unix to Windows. Um, the target computer in the aircraft is actually a power PC, so that's how old the technology is. Um, going from 32-bit to 64-bit architecture, it wasn't a really big problem. Um, we had to redefine some of the ADA types because uh, there, might have, there were a couple of um, issues with byte boundaries, but uh, thankfully the ADA compiler picked those up fairly easily. Uh, the biggest challenges were with a sandboxed application. Moving, um, moving to threads wasn't in itself a big deal, but because we had to refactor a whole lot of names for functions uh, in across the different code sets, um, I guess that's the disadvantage of taking something that was originally written uh, for a host testing environment and trying to um, pigeonhole it into, a, I guess, a target application. And also providing access to the uh, file system Debugging was a real, it was a bit of an issue as well. Um, you can get into the ADA code uh, in the Swift debugger. Eventually, somehow, sometimes it gets in there, and you can actually set breakpoints in there, which is another curious thing. Um, but it's very hit and miss. Uh, you can't just bring up the ADA code and say I want a breakpoint there. You have to sort of get the thing to crash in there somehow, and then um, set a breakpoint. But uh, interestingly enough. When the debugger stops, uh, it brings up the ADA code and it, it stops on the right line. So um, there is um, the ADA core toolset uses a GNU debugger um, toolset. So there are ways of, I guess, attaching to it to the process. But because of Apple system integrity protection, it makes it challenging. Uh, I think you need a signed debugger, and you know, it's very hard to figure out how to do that sometimes. Um, one of, the, one of the challenging parts for us too was the um, TCP IP programming. Uh, neither myself nor my uh, Ada uh, colleague had done a lot of work in this area. Uh, I use core foundation streams for it. Um, there's probably better ways of doing that, I don't know. Uh, and 
it took around, I guess, three man months over a period of approximately 12 months. We were doing this in our spare time, I guess. Um, the app itself is about 52 megabytes. Uh, it'd be a bit bigger if we had the MTC in there as well. Um, where to now? Um, yeah, well, we need a business case. <laughs> the um, the tool set is about 35k uh, licensing per year. So um, I don't know how we're going to get someone to pay for that. Uh, we're trying to get our European colleagues uh, interested in the project. To make it ses successful, it needs to be a repeatable process. So every time we change the aircraft software, we'd have to update this as well. Um, bearing in mind this is just a training aid as well, so it's an awful lot of expense to go to for a training aid. At the moment, it's a bit slow. Um, I guess we could look at how we could uh, fix that up, but having a look at um, this morning's um, uh, talk, it seems that um, iPads can do a fair bit. Um, uh, they have reasonably good processing power. Uh, if the graphics can do it, maybe we can palm off some stuff to the GP, GPU, I don't know. Um, the user interface is not quite finished. Uh, that needs a bit of work. The other challenge that we had was uh, we, we're going to face is how do we know what page we're on now that we're looking in a real system. Uh, the way we did it before was um, I had a, I set up a um, property list file. It had all the page names and image names and it set it, I set it up in a sort of structure where you, could, you knew exactly where you were. Um, now we won't know that so that's going to be an interesting uh, thing to figure out how, we, um, how we're going to solve that problem. Um, just in conclusion, I'd like to th uh, thank um, Dedicated Systems, who are the, the agents for AdaCore in Australia, and AdaCore themselves um, wouldn't have been able to do it without their help. Um, Dedicated Systems provide us the contacts with AdaCore, and um, AdaCore, fantastic to work with. Um, they responded to our queries uh, overnight. Uh, they work, they work out of, I think, uh, New York and um, Paris. So. Um, Getting, getting responses overnight was fantastic. Um, so both organisations have been really great. Um, so that's me, that was um, Ada on an iPad. It is possible. Thank you.